The second segment will be the interrogatories. Each team will have 10 minutes to speak in a crossfire manner. During this time, both teams will question their opponents and answer questions by the opposing team. The 10 minutes for interrogatories include the time taken for each team to ask and reply to questions. After each speaker has spoken for one minute, the bell will be rung once, and while the speaker may continue speaking to finish his point, time will continue to run against the team. If a speaker finishes his speech before the one minute is over, any excess time will roll over and be available to his teammates. When a team has one minute of time remaining, the bell will be rung twice. Finally, once a team's full 10 minutes have been used up, the bell will be rung three times. I now invite the proposition to commence the interrogatories. The Misuse of Drugs Act has been instrumental in rehabilitating 1,350 people in 2002. Instead of condemning them to a decade of misery in prison and a huge fine, we ask that opposition how will they treat these drug addicts. Thank you for the question, Madam. Now, in response to the question posed by side proposition, we believe that it's certainly possible to rehabilitate both drug addicts and terrorists under a trial system by allowing them to undergo the same programs after going through a trial and after being convicted. And we'd like to pose a question to their side. They tell us about the ineffectiveness of the judiciary. Now, if the judiciary is so ineffective, then why don't they let the executive handle the trials of other similarly dangerous crimes, like the crime of financial speculation, which does lots of damage to Singapore's economy and the crime of serial killing, which instills fear in the populace of Singapore. I want to do three things. First, I want to tell a house today that prison is actually a very harsh place to live in. You're put in a cell which is very small in unfamiliar circumstances, in a, in a place where the worst criminals of society live alongside you. If you want to be rehabilitated from your drug addiction or from fundamentalist beliefs, putting you in such a harsh environment will only turn you away. And that's why our child system will not work. The second thing I want to do is take down the idea that we should use this system for other crimes as well. The difference is that when we fight a war against terror or organized crime, this war is still ongoing. And what happens today in a courtroom affects the lives of other people out there when we compromise intelligence and so on. And that's the fundamental difference between other crimes of severity. I want to do one last thing, which is attack their case further. They told us that other laws in society can help to protect us. We disagree. Other laws fail for the problems that my first speaker already told you about. Even if you criminalize things like funding terrorist organizations, how do you prove that an individual was funding a terrorist organization if you don't have clear evidence? Or if you don't have evidence that you can use without compromising on the identity of operative or intelligence services? Their side hurts our protection. The speakers are reminded to speak into the mic. Thank you for that question. We think that firstly that reasoning is flawed because that presumes that prison is going to turn every single criminal into a harsher criminal. So by that logic, then we believe that they are going to have to stand for some kind of other kind of reformative institution after some kind of trial system. So we don't think that really makes sense unless they don't want to stand for prisons at all. But above and beyond that, if you listen to the language that they're using, they don't even stand for any kind of evidence in order to prosecute an individual. What they fundamentally seem to be standing for is detention without trial based on thoughts, based on intentions without any kind of motive, without any kind of proven action towards committing a crime, we think that that's fundamentally overbearing and that's not the prerogative of the executive. But even more than that, we would like to ask them that by presuming guilt before innocence, they devalue individual liberty because the presumption of innocence rests on the logic that if liberty is so precious, it is better for a guilty person to go free. Is this wrong? proposition does not believe that a man is guilty until proven innocent or that we assume him to be guilty. Rather, what we've said is that the courtroom is not the right place to adjudicate if an individual is a threat to society. We've given you several levels of checks and balances, ranging from the director of the ISD to the minister of home affairs to an independent advisory board. At each of these stages, individuals can review whether an individual is a threat to society. So this is not an assumption on our part. We still want the other side to tell us how a more a more brutal punishment in, in, of, of a courtroom when you, when you force someone into prison for 10 years or in their own words, when you force someone to the death penalty, how that is going to help you fight the war against terror, how that is going to help you rehabilitate an individual as opposed to our side where we can give you the support you need but use detention without trial as a means of ensuring that you get that support rather than walking away. Yeah. 
Thank you for the question. Now, in response to the arguments the proposition has raised about rehabilitation, we believe that this is fundamentally not what the debate is about. What we stand for is the right to a trial. If you want to rehabilitate terrorists and drug addicts after they've been tried and after they've been proven guilty, then you can put them in a separate institution from prisons. We think that's something which is good in many cases. They talk about the checks and balances within acts like the Internal Security Act. We say that these checks don't allow for a substitute to a trial system because of the fact that the advice advisory board isn't an adversarial system and doesn't cross-examine witnesses and evidence, so there's no way to truly find out the veracity of such evidence and such testimony. And we'd like to pose them a further question. Under their logic, an individual is going to remain locked up under preventive detention unless he can prove his innocence. This is the reverse of the traditional trial system, where if the prosecution can't build a case, the plaintiff is set free. So we ask them how they stand for this presumption of guilt, which goes against all legal principles. Shame on team op opposition to tell us that rehabilitation of people in, in society is not the core of this debate. The Misuse of Drugs Act was specifically worded to ensure that individuals wouldn't have to suffer in prison, instead they could be sent to rehabilitation centres. In 2002 alone, there were 1,300 individuals who were rehabilitated from their drug addictions. And that's 1,300 very strong reasons why detention without trial is justified for the people of Singapore. Don't let team opposition tell you this isn't relevant. But okay, we're going to engage them on their grounds anyway. Does the advisory board work? Yes, it does. We're going to pose a very fundamental question at the heart of their case. Why is an adversarial system important? Beyond asserting this to us by saying it's important, they've not actually given us a reason. We propose to you that in a situation where you need to face certain threats to all our collective security, having an adversarial system where you try to destroy each other's cases is not the best way to determine how much of a threat an individual is. And that's why an advisory board comprising the expertise of a judge along with the expertise of a layman on the street is the best place to make such a decision. I thank you very much for the question. I think that if side proposition wants to continue pushing the issue of rehabilitation, they need to prove to us why you need detention without trial to rehabilitate. Why can't you do this with a normal trial system? I'm going to take this one step further. They keep talking to us about how a trial system cannot work because of the issue of evidence. Firstly, we've already told them how we are willing to modify the conventional trial system, including a media blackout. We think that addresses the scope of their questions. But more than this, why exactly is the adversarial process so important? We think that this is because it protects the rights of the innocent. You cannot assume someone is guilty that is against the principles of justice. We've already proven to you that in a substantive. Now I'm going to pose one further question to the team proposition. Even though the advisory board can summon witnesses, it cannot cross-examine witnesses. This means that inconsistencies and errors in witness testimonies cannot be reviewed, which means that there is no way to fairly determine the guilt of the detained. How do you wish to proceed? Firstly, let's talk about rehabilitation and why it's important. And why essentially in detention without trial, we enable rehabilitation better. And this is because essentially when you bring a person to court, when you bring a young first-time offender to court, he goes out carrying the stigma and the symbolic resonance of a conviction. He is labelled a drug addict, he is labelled a terrorist, for example. And because of that, rehabilitation is essentially very, doesn't take place as easily, for example, as we have already proven to you because of the environment involved in the prison. But let's talk about what team opposition has proposed. Essentially, they say that what they're willing to do, and I quote, is to modify the demands of a trial to suit the needs of the proceedings. And we say essentially that firstly, this doesn't get around the problem at all. Essentially, it doesn't negate the incompa incompa incompatibility of a trial due to the burden of proof, for example. Specifically, we've, put, we've brought up to you, for example, that, um, that, that, that for, they've brought up to us that for instance, the use of inquiry offences to charge the individual. But we think these laws are insufficient because, for example, conspiracy laws are hard, are hard to prove because essentially you need to be able to outline a clear plan and agreement of action and the attempt laws are even harder to prove because, well, the individual has to have actually attempted something. So essentially, even modifying a trial still poses a problem and it doesn't reduce the, the issue of uh, the, the issue of information leaking out, for example, unless opposition is willing to shut off all communication from the defendant and the defendant's counsel from the rest of the world. And we're going to ask the opposition, are they willing to do that? <laughs> 
Thank you for the question. Now, in response to what their side has told us about rehabilitation, we'd like to point out that the Misuse of Drugs Act in and of itself doesn't allow for preventive detention. It merely shifts the burden of proving that an individual was not involved in drug crimes to the accused. They talk about stigma of a trial for young offenders. But we ask them, if a young offender is preventively detained, is there really any less stigma than if you were forced to go through the court system? If they're afraid of stigma in the court system, then they can send young offenders to closed courts or the family and juvenile court where their identities are redacted from the press. They talk about how our modification of the demands of a trial is principally inconsistent. We say no. We stand for the burden of proof on, on, uh, on the prosecution to ensure that the individuals assume innocent before proven guilty. What their side stands for is fundamentally the detention of individuals on an uncertain balance of probabilities. And here they try to tell us that under current laws, an individual has to attempt something before he can be locked up. We don't think that really squares with their case because presumably they would only detain individuals without trial when they have attempted something as well. So what they're doing is principally inconsistent and is wrong. We'd like to ask them what they propose amounts to a separate legal system for terrorists and dangerous individuals. We think this mythologizes terrorists by instilling fear in the rest of society by saying that the terrorists are such dangerous people. I want to do two things. First, I'm going to cite Chief Justice Chan Se Kyung, who argued just last this, this year that current legislation provides for three types of preventive detention vis-a-vis -vis the Internal Security Act, the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act, and the Misuse of Drugs Act. So we don't see how Team ACJC telling us that the MDA is not part of this debate suddenly makes it truth. But the second and more important thing I want to do is paint a picture of the kind of legal system they are going to have. Because they tell us that now they can also prosecute individuals just for you know, planning a certain operation without having that much of a proof of an attempt or conspiracy. In their world, they want to you know, do things that would prevent the information in the courtroom from leaking out. So presumably this would mean that the defendant can now no longer communicate with the outside world. Because if the defendant and the defense counsel heard something in the courtroom and could then reveal it, this means that information leaks out. Presumably, their side would change the burden of proof in order to, to guarantee prosecutions and the ability to lock up threats to society. We argue that if you try and modify a trial so much, you take away from what it means to have a fair and free trial. Rather than do that, it is better to have a system where we acknowledge that some processes and some situations are not suited for the courtroom, as Lord Diplock argued. And in that case, go with Team Proposition. Uh, we thank them for their statement because they didn't really ask us a question, but we think that fundamentally, as they pointed out within their opening, there are some things which a trial has to have. That's the presentation of witnesses, that's the cross-examination of them, and the presentation of evidence as well. In any case, even with all the amendments made to a trial in our case, these are still preserved, and these still preserve the adversarial process where the guilt of an individual has to be proven. And that is something that we preserve on our side of the house, and they don't. We think that fundamentally we have asked them time and again, what exactly is the kind of evidence and what is the threshold for evidence that they're going to use to detain individuals without trial? Up to this point, they haven't given us an answer, we demand an answer from them before they can proceed. But even more than that, we would question whether they would preemptively arrest financial speculators or opposition leaders, seemingly because there's some kind of existential threat and harm to the rest of society which could accrue from these people continuing within society. They haven't given us a clear dichotomy between the kind of crimes that they are going to preemptively detain for and the kind of crimes they were questioning them about. We ask them to do that. I'm going to talk about two things. Firstly, the idea of a trial. We ask the side opposition, why is it that an advisory board is unable to determine whether someone is guilty and then make the decision uh, and then make the recommendation to the president to veto their decision? We see that in their system, where they want to supposedly uh, preserve the cross-examination and the bring forth of witnesses in trials, they haven't told us exactly how this mechanism will work without compromising operators, without compromising secret information that could have disastrous consequences in the future. <coughs> they need to answer us on that. And the second idea on when exactly will we exercise detention, um, detention without trial? We say very simply that in the constitution it says to protect security and when the, someone is a, a threat to, uh, prejudicial to the security of Singapore. And we say that in this case opposition leaders do not fall under that purview and we are only debating on detention without trial as it exists in Singapore, meaning the CLCPA, uh, MDA and ISA. So they cannot make us argue on something that doesn't exist. Thank you for the question. Now, 
In response to their arguments about why the advisory board cannot be a substitute for a trial, we'd like to point out that the advisory board fundamentally isn't adversarial. This means that the advisory board members are actively rebutting arguments made by the defence lawyer and so don't get to, to really consider both sides of the case. Contrast this with our system, where in a trial, a judge can weigh the arguments presented by both the prosecution and defence and see which one makes more sense, thereby ensuring that the verdict is much fairer. More than that, an advisory board can consider evidence not admissible in court, such as those obtained through torture by, by foreign intelligence agencies, and we don't think such evidence is really reliable, it can't substitute for a court. They asked us how we, how we are going to allow crucial evidence from foreign intelligence agencies to stand up in a court. If this intelligence is really so crucial to a case, we've told you that we can have media blackouts, we can have prohibitions against reporting on court procedures, and this is how we preserve the secrecy of witnesses and on evidence. We tell them that opposition leaders have been detained in the past, using the logic that their policies would be detrimental to Singapore's existence, we ask them why they wouldn't do this under their case. And we'd like to ask them one further question. If they believe so much in the necessity for preemption, would they stand for torture and for wiretapping and other methods which presume guilt before innocence? I'm going to say some things which I've said again, and I'm going to bring some new material to this debate. Our first question is the same question. Why is an adversarial system important? Beyond asserting again and again, Team ACJC has not given us a reason. Whereas we've told you that perhaps an adversarial system is not the best place to solve such threats to Singapore. But okay, even if it was true that an adversarial system was needed, just because argument is good for the sake of argument, we argue that the advisory board can bring that level of expertise in as well. Within the board, you will tend to have dis disagreement and opinions. Even if the advisory board agrees on one thing and the Minister of Home Affairs agrees on another, then the President is the one who gets to make a final decision on which side of this disagreement he wishes to believe in. In all these levels of checks and balances, there is enough discourse and disagreement to ensure that whether an individual is a threat can be reasonably determined. The last thing we want to ask team opposition is this. How would their side exactly propose modifying a trial? Because as we've told you, if you modify the trial in ways which, for example, not allow the defendant to look at a witness or cross-examine a witness, this means that you destroy the integrity of the trial system. But on the other hand, if you allow them to cross-examine a witness, then the information and intelligence we once had is now lost. Which are they willing to accept? We thank them for that question and we think that it's fundamentally ironic that they ask us why the adversarial process is so important when from the beginning of this debate we have shown you how it's ethical, it's moral and it has been enshrined in legal principles that individuals should have the right to prove their innocence because number one, that is what we believe is principally justified and number two, we think that legally that is going to bring about the fairest outcome because it is within this adversarial process that we can truly sieve out those who are guilty from those who are innocent and in so doing, preserve some kind of legitimacy for the monopoly of force that the executive has as the prosecuting institution. Then they talked about the advisory board and how that has expertise. Well, I'd like to read them from a Ministry of Home Affairs press release which says that the advisory board, which is made up of only three individuals by the way, is made up two-thirds of laypersons, one being a businessman and the other being a private medical practitioner. We question if they really are willing to rest some kind of j inquisitorial judicial process on these individuals. We question whether they can really preserve some kind of judicial legitimacy within this opaque process that they stand for. While the opposition has been going on and on about the advisory board, we like to point out that there are a whole range, a whole host of other checks involved that ensure that the decision made to detain someone is not made arbitrarily or at whim. And we want them to deal with those checks as well. But on top of that, let's talk about the advisory board then. And they say essentially that it doesn't preserve the adversarial nature of a trial. And we say, well, fine, that's good, because that's what we want, because we want to protect information like where our witnesses are, who they are, and what, about, what accounts we are checking, what, te what telephone lines we've tapped, and we don't want terrorists to be able to get away with that information through the defendant or through the defendant's counsel. And they have to come up with us and tell us how they are going to protect society as a whole when they are willing to compromise on such information. But at the end of the day, we say we want to err on the side of caution and, and because there's a premium place of security, we want to protect, the, protect the, the needs of the people best. And we want to ask them at the end of the day, how do they protect society? Thank you for the question. 
Now, in response to their arguments that the adversarial system isn't important, we say that it is. Why is the adversarial system important? It allows two sides, both represented by lawyers, to argue their case in front of a judge. This allows the judge to see whose side's arguments make more sense and therefore judge more fairly on the guilt of the accused. Contrast this with an inquisitorial system, which the advisory board models something they stand for. In an inquisitorial system, only one side of the case is presented because the judges are actively trying to rebut the arguments made by the counsel for the defense and therefore don't get to see and don't get to overcome the cognitive blind spots that might allow them to see why the accused is innocent. They ask us why the other checks on the advisory board aren't effective. We say the courts cannot inquire into the good faith or bona fides of the president and therefore his veto on the advisory board is completely arbitrary. We think they still haven't answered this as to why they wouldn't allow other preemptive methods for justice like wiretapping and torture, things which we think they fundamentally don't want to stand for but are afraid to say so. I'm sorry, I'm going to make two things clear before we end off our interrogatories on team proposition. First is to say whether or not we stand for other preemptive measures is looking at the debate in the wrong way. Perhaps we could stand for things like wiretapping, as we already do in the status quo. That doesn't mean we have to stand for torture or any other line on the spectrum. This debate is about whether this instance is a good balance between the rights of the individual and the rights of society. But I think we've had enough of a very big debate on the checks and balances. We want to take this debate one level back and take a look at the bigger picture. Because from the start of this debate, Team Proposition has argued that some national security issues are not meant for the courtroom because the judge is not well placed to make such a decision. We gave you the quote of Diplock. Let's give you one more quote from this case where the Justice Roskill said that powers such as those relating to the defense of the realm are not susceptible to judicial review because their nature and subject matter is such as not to be amenable to the judicial process. And we want team opposition to give us a reply to this very big point. Thank you, sir. I think we'd like to point out that Lord Diplock and the Diplock courts were completely delegitimized for undermining judicial processes within Northern Ireland against the Irish Republican Army insurgents. We don't think that's the kind of legal or justice system that we want to see in Singapore anyway, because we think that collective and communitarian security, which is what they stand for, is given meaning by the ability of individuals to actualize themselves in society and to have some kind of protection against the government that governs and stands over them. And we believe that fundamentally, the legal institution which guards against that is an adversarial court process. They haven't been able to take that down to this point. But we think even more than that, they haven't shown why there's an arbitrary dichotomy between the kind of measures that they're willing to take and the kind of measures that they're not willing to. We think that they haven't really been able to show any kind of balance in the rights of the executive and the rights of the individual. We fear the, the state that they stand for. <laughs>